good evening and uh, good morning, uh, depending where you are, and also good afternoon. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, we are very honored and pleased to have uh, to host this uh, CCG China US Think Tank Dialogue, which is a part of our ongoing seventh annual China and Globalization Forum. And this dialogue was co-organized, is co-organized with uh, Asia Foundation. So CCG China and Globalization Forum is CCG a flagship annual forum that we hold uh, uh, once every year. And this year, uh, actually, we have a, a draw a very large uh, 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 attendance. And uh, uh, actually, since uh, uh, we had this in 2015, this is probably one of the largest. It has been hosted uh, uh, in conjunction with our uh, CCG Council members. Also, we bring together uh, most prominent uh, 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 business leaders, uh, uh, government officials, academia, and also uh, 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 non-government sector as well. Hmm. I mean, during the last uh, actually uh, uh, two days, we had uh, four to five hundred participants attended our conference, and uh, now we are we are getting into the uh, webinar part of our conference, uh, which is also open to our, all participants and also uh, can be watched online. Uh, actually. Uh, this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, which is going on, and uh, now China also discovered new cases. So how can we really cope with that is, uh, is one of the actual issues we talked about. And uh, we had also discussed about global economy, trade, uh, mobility of the, of the people, uh, China, European uh, uh, economic cooperation, uh, global cooperation and China's new development plan, and of course, uh, uh, a chance new international communication uh, narrative as well. So on the U.S. part, we're actually having uh, uh, three webinars uh, 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 that uh, as our uh, uh, China-U.S. Uh, part of the, of the dialogue. And tonight is actually the, the feature webinar of uh, uh, China-U.S. think tank dialogue, which we joined uh, with very four distinguished uh, uh, speakers. Uh, so today's dialogue actually features the theme of balancing competition and cooperation amongst the global challenges. What's next for the U.S.-China relations? As we all know, last, last week, the U.S. Uh, Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Wendy Sherman, just concluded her visit, first visit uh, for the Biden administration of officials to China, and a new Chinese ambassador, uh, Qin Gang, uh, just arrived in Washington this week. So we have a lot of uh, uh, questions and a lot of uh, uh, curiosity and uh, for how U.S. and China can maintain. It's a moment of a diplomatic dialogue, but also we want to hear the views from our uh, speakers today, uh, which from uh, Adam Posen, uh, Steve Roy, uh, John Fountain, and also uh, Minister Zhu, Zhu Guangyang. But let me uh, quickly introduce our, our guest today. Uh, uh, I, I do this as a, a forbidden order. Uh, Adam uh, Posen has been the president of the Peterson Institute of Economic, International Eco Economics since 2013. I mean, the, the Peterson Institute is well known, is an independent, non profit, non partisan research organization dedicated to strengthening prosperity and human welfare in a global economy through expert analysis and practical policy solutions. Uh, for his career, Adam has contributed to research and public policy regarding monetary and fiscal <coughs> policies in the G20, the challenge of European integration, this is adoption of the EU, EU China-US economic relation, which is a very active uh, uh, Peterson Institute, and develop new approaches for financial recovery and stability. During his uh, presidency, the Peterson Institute has won global recognition as the leading independent think tank in international economics. And of course, we have our old friend, uh, 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 Ambassador Stephen Roy, and uh, he's the Asia Foundation's trustee emeritus and also a former U.S. ambassador to China. Uh, the Asia Foundation is a nonprofit international development organization committed to pro improving the lives across a dynamic and developing Asia. Ambassador Roy is a, is a foreign a Chinese uh, speaker, actually, he's he was born in China, and he actually spent time in, in, in Chengdu and, and uh, has a lot of good fond memories there. Uh, and he spent much of his career in the East Asia. 
and uh, has a three-time ambassador serving as U.S. envoy to Singapore and to uh, People's Republic of China, 1991 to 1995, and also Indonesia. And uh, in 1996, he was promoted to the rank of a Korea ambassador, the highest rank in the United States Foreign Service. Also now, uh, Ambassador Rowe is the founding director, Emirates, and also distinguished scholar at the Wilson Center Kissinger Institute on China and the United States, and the trustee of a Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. As we all know that uh, this year also marks the 50th anniversary of uh, uh, Dr. Kissinger's secret visit to China. So, so it will be probably one of our uh, topics tonight as well. And of course, we have, uh, 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 we have a Mr. John Thornton, is the chair emeritus and of the Booking Institution and co-chair of Asia Society. So we know that Booking Institution and Asia Society are two very prominent uh, think tanks and uh, in the United States that has really has a uh, big influence, uh, not only in the US, but also uh, in the world and also in China as well. So uh, that uh, uh, John is actually uh, chair of both organizations, uh, uh, speaks volumes. He's also the executive chairman of Barrett Gold and chairman of the Pine Bridge Investments. And of course, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, on top of that, uh, John is also a professor and the director of a global leadership program at the Tsinghua University School of Economic and Management in Beijing. Uh, John retired in 2003 as the president and a member of the board of the Goldman Sachs Group. So has a very, uh, very long, uh, rich uh, career. Uh, in 2007, Institution Investor Magazine named uh, Mr. Santa as one of the 14 individuals who have the greatest influence in shaping global financial markets over the previous 40 years. And he's was, he was also a recipient of, in 2008 of the Friendship Award of the People's Republic of China, which is the highest honor of, accorded to the non-Chinese citizen. And also Chinese government also named him as one of the 15 foreign experts who has made most significant contribution to China's development over the previous three decades. So a very, very uh, uh, notable achievement. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, my friend, also uh, my colleagues, uh, at uh, uh, State Council, uh, Minister Zhu Guangyao. And uh, Minister Zhu Guangyao is a CCG advisor and a former Vice Minister of Finance of China from 2010 to 2018. Uh, as a Vice Minister of Finance, Minister Zhu oversaw the Customer Tariff Department as well as coordinating economic track of the China-US strategic and economic dialogue and also the financial Shepherd of the G20 for the ministry. I mean, he joined the Minister of Finance in 1985 and served in various positions with the ministry, also included as a senior advisor, alternate exec director, and direct exec director of the China to the World Bank uh, in, in two occasions. So, uh, so actually, we are very pleased to be joined by uh, 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 Minister Zhu as well. Uh, myself, I'm the uh, uh, I'm the founder and president of Center for China and Globalization, and also uh, one of the uh, leading Chinese think tank, and also we are one of the top uh, 100 think tanks ranked by University of Pennsylvania. And Minister Zhu is also uh, our advisor for the think tank. So this is a think tank dialogue uh, we are between the Chinese and US uh, 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 think tanks. So I'm very pleased to, uh, to uh, be the host of this dialogue tonight. I would like to actually start with, uh, with Adam. I mean, you are, you are actually very uh, knowledgeable. You've been traveling to China, and I, I see that you have uh, made a lot of uh, uh, remarks about uh, China, US, how it should collaborate, how, how they should improve, or how can, uh, you know, including the, 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 the uh, CPTPP and also a lot of re trade issues. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll start with you and uh, 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 in, in, in your, in your, in your uh, you know, in your position as the think tank, uh, what is the what is the uh, thinking of the U.S. economy, Chinese economy, and how we get out of this <laughs> pandemic? Uh, how about the U.S.-China relations? Uh, what are the uh, you know trade, uh, which is uh, one of the theme of our conference today? People view that as the biggest uh, uh, promoter for for the global uh, future development as the World Bank uh, uh, chief uh, he said here in our conference today. So what do you think? I mean, as you are very uh, savvy in, the, in this subject. 
Uh, Adam, you floor, please. Thank you very much, President Wine, for including me on this distinguished panel, and congratulations to your center for continuing to lead substantive dialogue in China and globally. Obviously, this is a major conference. Um, I think the big message of what the questions you raise is really to say that the U.S.-China conflict and frictions are not about economics, even though they currently take place in economics. And this has been a major preoccupation under Trump and again under Biden. And as I argued in my recent article in Foreign Affairs on the price of nostalgia, it mostly is being driven by politics in both China and the U.S., where they basically the males working in industry in non-urban centers are blackmailing the rest of society. Um, and we see this with the state-owned enterprises in China. We see this with the trade bailouts of the heavy industry in the U.S. And in both countries, those parts of the economy are a shrinking part of the economy and a shrinking even faster part of employment. Um, they also are industries that are, of course, toxic to our environment as well as to our politics. And so what we are seeing is both the U.S. American and Chinese peoples are being ill-served by the trade conflict. And it's not about economics. Um, and so what we've seen under the Biden administration and in response in part and in part of its own initiative from the Xi government is a shift now from trade to worrying about technology. Uh, obviously, there have been frictions for many years. Uh, the others on this panel have been dealing with them directly for even longer than I have um, over issues of intellectual property, over issues of government subsidies. But for the most part, these have not been issues that should have imperiled the broader relationship on any economic basis. What has escalated it now is the sense in the U.S. and China that each is posing a genuine threat in a geopolitical sense and in a sense to their system or their legitimacy. And this is a reality among the official class in both Washington and Beijing. There's some good reason for it. It's mostly exaggerated. Um, and it colors, of course, every interaction. And so the question is, what can we do from here? Um, let me make three very brief points so you can get to the others on the, on the panel. First, remember that both the US and China have led the world in recovery from the COVID crisis and are both growing well above trend growth rates right now by a large margin. So this is not a question of either is depriving the other of economic recovery. So there is no conflict over currency right now. There is no issue of Chinese surpluses coming at US expense. There is no issue of financial instability being promoted from one to the other or back and forth. So we have to focus on the non-economic issues, which is funny for an economist like me to say. The second point is, as you've indicated in your setup for this discussion, President Wang and others I know have spoken about, it, even though it's boring, it has to be said. The biggest opportunity for collaboration between China and the US is on climate change issues. That was the case when President Obama was here, when our friend Minister Zhu was very active in the G7 and the G20, and that remains the best place for us to collaborate at this time. And third, since you were wise enough uh, and generous enough to convene a group of think tankers, I just want to say that we, like CCG, Peterson Institute, Brookings, the Kissinger Center, the ministry's own think tank, Ministry of Finance own think tank, we all have a role in continuing to say that we should not be afraid of honest dialogue among experts. We have a common enemy in conspiracy theories and disinformation. 
And we think tanks should be binding, bounding ourselves together to emphasize the possibility of objective analysis and honest, frank talk. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Adam, for your for your great uh, opening uh, opening remark. Uh, absolutely, I mean, uh, you, I agree with you that uh, it seems that non non economic issue that really deterred us from uh, talking uh, of the real substance and, and where at the time we need to collaborate on pandemic fighting, climate change, and and many other things. Uh, uh, so this is really needed a frank dialogue between the two uh, two sides think tanks. So you, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, perhaps I, I can also let the uh, uh, ambassador Rod to give some opening remark as well. I mean, uh, you are a seasoned diplomat. I mean, you also know China since you were <laughs> a child. Uh, you lived through, uh, 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 you know, many, many uh, uh, years of uh, uh, turmoil and, and uh, all those uh, all, the, all the times. And uh, I remember visiting you uh, in your office or when I was as a, 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 a visiting fellow at Bookings. Uh, in 2010, I mean, you, you showed me <laughs> all those good, uh, uh, you know, photos and things like that. So, so, so I, I would like to really ask, you know, you witnessed so many things uh, in China. So now we have a, a, a ambassador, uh, a new Chinese ambassador to go to the U.S. We don't know why is the U.S. ambassador to China, but, but we had a visit of uh, 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 Deputy Secretary uh, 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 Randy Sherman. So. What's your take on the, on the sign of U.S. relation, past, present, and future? Because you were also uh, the founding director of a Kissinger Institute. And this year is uh, 50 years of uh, Kissinger's second visit to China. We had just uh, uh, the other day on the uh, 11th of, uh, of July, we had a live dialogue to, uh, uh, to commemorate uh, his uh, historic visit. Uh, we had a dialogue with uh, uh, Dr. Kissinger that day. And uh, so... So, so you must uh, uh, have a lot of uh, uh, feelings on that, uh, since you, 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 your, your institute at Wilson Center is named after him. And of course, this year is also China joined the UN for the 50 years, China joined WTO for, for 20 years, China joined APAC for 30 years, and it's the Cold War Andy 30 years. So a lot of it's going on, past, present, future. So as a senior, as, as, uh, as seasoned as you, I mean, you're, uh, uh, voice is really uh, thinking is really uh, much uh, noticed here. So, uh, Ambassador Roy, your turn, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wang, and good evening to all of you who are in China. When President Trump lost the November 2020 presidential elections in the United States, some people hoped that President Biden would adopt a less confrontational approach to relations with China. They have been disappointed. Early steps by the new American administration toward China seem to be a continuation of President Trump's hardline policies. Shortly after the administration took office, the new Secretary of State echoed the charge of his predecessor that China was engaged in genocide against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. The tariff barriers on bilateral trade have been left in place. Senior officials in the Biden administration bluntly stated that the U.S. engagement strategy toward China had failed and that competition is now the principal driver in the bilateral relationship. For much of the last 50 years, the United States was confident that China's growing wealth and power did not threaten United States vital interests and that differences could be managed by diplomacy and engagement. That is no longer the case. And the question is, why? A starting point to understanding what has happened is to recognize that the United States and China are both in the midst of fundamental transitions that affect their respective places in the world. The United States is seeking to adjust to an international situation in which it is no longer the sole superpower. This is not so much because of a decline in power but because other countries have risen to major power status, and China, of course, is the first and foremost example of that. A new multipolar world is emerging. Not surprisingly, the United States is reluctant to give up the dominant position that it has occupied since the end of the Cold War. 
and to accept the adjustments that it must make in order to establish a new equilibrium. At the same time, there is no question that the social and, politi and political polarization that has been a prominent feature of the U.S. domestic scene over the last half decade has damaged the international image of the United States and the perception of its reliability as a great power. China, in turn, in a remarkably short period of time, has regained the wealth and military strength that are the attributes of major powers. This has altered the psychology of the Chinese people. This is what Zheng Bijian didn't take into account when he came up with the concept of peaceful rise. The Chinese people now are demanding a more muscular foreign policy, consistent with China's growing power. And it has changed China's behavior patterns, which have become more assertive. As a result, regional countries, including the United States, find China's assurances less and less credible that it will rise peacefully and never bully its neighbors. These are two of the key background factors that have influenced the sharp plunge in the bilateral U.S.-China relationship to the lowest depths in half a century. This has created a dangerous situation where missteps by either side or by both could plunge the world into an unprecedented crisis. I use the term unprecedented because China and the United States are both major nuclear powers and confrontations between them are particularly dangerous. Repair work by both sides is vitally necessary. Fortunately, despite some superficial similarities, the Biden administration is fundamentally different from its predecessor. President Biden has more foreign policy and national security experience than any American president since the first President Bush 30 years ago. In contrast to the Trump administration, President Biden has appointed capable and experienced officials as Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. These are officials who could sit down without talking points and talk for hours with Chinese counterparts about any issue in the world. And this was totally missing in the last administration. The Biden administration is moving carefully to iron out internal differences and adopt sustainable policies that will not simply reflect the whims of the moment. Of particular importance for US-China relations, the administration has reaffirmed that it will adhere to a one China policy and that it does not support independence for Taiwan. It is also seeking a pattern of regular consultations between Beijing and Washington. The recent consultations between U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman and State Counselor Foreign Minister Wang Yi and Vice Minister Xia Feng were surrounded by a barrage of charges by each side against the other. However, if one reads carefully the public reports regarding the consultations, it is evident that there were constructive elements. According to the Chinese account of the meeting, Deputy Secretary Sherman called the U.S.-China relationship the most important bilateral relationship in the world, noted the many times the two sides have had contact with each other since President Biden was sworn in, expressed U.S. willingness to have open and candid contacts and dialogues with China, declared the United States hopes that two countries can coexist peacefully, said the United States has no intention of restricting China's development, does not want to contain China, and would like to see China develop further. Noted the two sides can engage in healthy competition, cooperate on climate change, drug control, and international and regional hotspots, and strengthen crisis management cap capacity and avoid conflicts. American accounts of the meeting, uh, the meetings she had, are consistent with the above statements. These are encouraging words that you would not have heard from the previous administration, but the reality is less positive. President Biden needs congressional support for his domestic programs and congressional attitudes toward China are hostile. Changing these attitudes will be difficult, but not impossible. 
a hardline American approach to China does not mesh well with the interests of U.S. allies and friends in East Asia who do not wish to see the region polarized. In other words, as the United States tries to work with our friends and allies, it will discover that they do not support a hardline approach to China. And I think that will have an impact over time. But as a first step, it would be useful for both China and the United States to tone down their rhetoric toward each other. Governments have the responsibility not only to formulate wise foreign policies, but to talk in ways that develop public support for those policies. And we are not doing that. We are talking publicly in ways that undermine the wise policies that we should be pursuing. And so as a starter, let's get our rhetoric under control. And I hope that we'll have some chance to exchange views about other steps that could be taken. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador Rao. Uh, yeah, you have made, uh, the, I think, very uh, a good uh, opening remark. This is really, uh, 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 I agree, a you know, deep concern <laughs> on both sides. I mean, uh, to, uh, we, we seems to, uh, 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 you know, really call, argue, and yell, and uh, and and and, uh, and uh, I, I agree that uh, Trump has done uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, probably uh, damage to the uh, the existing relations. But of course, there's there's a lot of problems also. But 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 I've ca the problem is that uh, I, I think uh, in the Trump administration, the 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 the, the core team he used is not that really, uh, as you said, uh, savvy on China. I mean, I had a debate at the monk debate with uh, with. Uh, uh, H.R. McMaster, I mean, he's a, a, a journal uh, fighting in Iraq and, and maybe not really that knowledge on China. We had Michael Pillsbury, <laughs> we talked about, but he's also more on the, on the military front. So, so we are actually uh, really lacking a, a, a great, uh, uh, you know, Chinese, uh, uh, China hand in the, in the, in the Trump administration. But, but we see that, absolutely, you're right. I mean, in the Biden administration, we we see Biden has, uh, has a long uh, knowledge of foreign policy, as you said. He's, uh, uh, he has met President Xi, uh, spent more time than any other uh, leaders in the world. And uh, so, so uh, he actually called the Chinese people on the eve of Chinese New Year, say Happy New Year to President Xi. And he actually stopped the use of uh, 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 referring wives to China virus. He issued some kind of exact order on that. So, so all those good, I think, has been noticed. But, but somehow, lately, we, we, we see there was there's some... Uh, acceleration uh, of, of changes maybe from China's point of view because we had uh, 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 you know the G7 summit uh, you know there's also a schedule on China and there's a, a, a NATO summit there's a US EU summit there's a EU, <laughs> US Russian summit you know so 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 now I'm glad that uh, uh, the uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Sherman visited China so we hope that we're going to start a new uh, new uh, dialogue. Uh, yeah, right. I think the, the dialogue this time in Tianjin was quite uh, more concrete now. There's a lot of issues has been raised, a lot of the concrete leads have been proposed. We hope to reduce all those uh, frictions maybe on both sides. One of the things I think probably, uh, you know, really uh, concern on China is this tracing this origin of, uh, of virus. I mean, that is already uh, 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 be, be, be actually uh, criticized during the, when they run the election. The Democrats already said that is really a conspiracy, <laughs> conspiracy because the WHO already sending a, a delegation, went to China, Wuhan, went to the lab, and they come with a, a, a suggestion that least possible uh, to have this kind of, a, uh, you know, this is man-made virus. So, so, you know, issues like that, I and mean, to have an FBI or CIA to, to make a conclusion on that is really uh, something I think probably we should, uh, 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 you know, not to, uh, to really, uh, emphasize too much on that because uh, it's it's going to divide. Uh, I think the current uh, uh, you know efforts to to really trying to get a dialogue on. So I don't know if, if you have anything on that. Uh, I mean this this virus issue is really getting <laughs> getting a little hot on the on the Biden administration. I agree with you. Everything other you know Biden is doing uh, is uh, is you know and there's a host of minister dialogues between USTR between the trade minister, the commerce minister, which is great. But uh, you know this this uh, issue, statement of uh, virus uh, sourcing, <laughs> uh, tracing the origin is really not uh, not uh, 
a, a practical idea. I, I don't know if you had any comments on that, uh, Ambassador Roth. A very brief comment. Uh, this in particular is an issue on which we should be cooperating and not fighting each other. Uh, I think it is important to trace the origins of the virus and we have our own views about how that should be pursued. Uh, but the basic point is pandemics threaten every country in the world. And if the two leading countries in the world are unable to cooperate in dealing with a common threat, then there's something wrong with both of us. And we need to consider what the problem is that is preventing us from cooperating uh, uh, on this very vital issue. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I agree with you. I think that is really key issue. We, U.S. and China, should really now, with the mutant of the of this virus, we should really work together to to fight that. You know, this this morning we had uh, in the conference we had the uh, 15 ambassadors uh, from you know old old countries, Europe, uh, Asia, Latin American, uh, uh, and, and and also we have the U.S. Uh, 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 Minister Council attending the conference this morning as well. You know, that, that is really, uh, you know, they all agree that the, the whole world should act together. We should, you know, making the mobility of the people around the world and have the vaccine passport or certification and find out the ways how we can really make the economy goes around uh, uh, movement rather than we focus on those tiny, uh, not tiny, but, you know, there's non-urgent issues because virus happened actually before uh, also, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, maybe even before Wuhan, but but let's let's do it. You know, if we do it, we do it systematically. Maybe what we really contend about it, rather than pinpoint on that as well. Oh, no, uh, I think that's probably what we can uh, talk later. But uh, again, I, I hope we're not uh, you know getting into that too much. But I, I'd like to invite uh, Minister Zhu now. Maybe you know after here two think tank uh, uh, leaders from the U.S. Uh, uh, you are, uh, you know, CC's advisor, and also you, you are also working the think tank of the Minister of Finance. Uh, so uh, you have you attended our conference this morning and uh, <laughs> speaking with Zanam, other uh, Chinese business uh, leaders and government officials, also former Minister of uh, uh, of Trade, uh, Minister Chen Deming also spoke, Vice Minister Chen Jian of Commerce also spoke and also a host of other international experts. So what's your take about this uh, US-China relations since you've been really uh, working on this for, uh, uh, you know, for a long time and really a top expert in China on the subject because you really led the strategic uh, and economic dialogue. You, you, you were the shepherd of G20. Uh, so what's your take on that? Thank you very much. It's my honor to join this uh, distinguished panel particularly after the President Paulson and uh, Ambassador Roy speech. I think I, I just try my best to directly discuss and uh, some response for Adam's side and uh, Ambassador Roy's side. Firstly, from the trace or range of virus, I remember in April, Last year, I had this phone call with Adam regarding how about China US cooperation to deal with the challenge of pandemic. That time, Adam suggests the two great countries must be cooperate, must enhance the transparency and must together within the WHO. That time, US administration you know, that's the attitude to WHO. But Adam, from that time, firmly support WHO play the leading role and uh, emphasize the importance of cooperation between China and the US to deal with the challenge of pandemic. And uh, I remember very clearly, he also suggested us to pay attention to the situation development even after China control the situation well, the global situation may be continue deteriorate. And uh, he point three I issue. India, Iran, and uh, Indonesia. He suggests us to think about 
if that's a deteriorated situation continually in the world, and uh, particularly 3i country is uh, very difficult. Unfortunately, what Adam said at that time, that's become the reality until today, the world still in the very difficult pandemic situation. And uh, this is not just a public health risk, it's already become systematic risk in the whole world. Economically, governance is also deeply be impacted and uh, really need China, US as uh, two important uh, economies cooperate together. But unfortunately, just as uh, President Paulson and uh, Ambassador Roy said, that's uh, China US relation now is really in the critical juncture. I think that's the big issue is the less trust each other. And uh, I think that's the person side, so something beyond the economy. That's indeed that's the situation. But there's two important countries. We must uh, keep communication and uh, greatly increase understanding each other and uh, try our best to restore the trust. I know this is not easy to do, but I still think economic relation is anchor for our relations. Last year, China-US trade volume 580 billion. Fourth half of this year, that's increased more than 50% that's the total amount for the six months of this year, US-China trade already 340 billion. So big pressure politically and uh, other negative impact, including both sides public opinion negative. And uh, we see the trade still increase. That's a good thing. That's why that's a good thing. That's, I think that's a very deeply integrated economy made our interest is so close connect. But we should post, Adam Paulson agree with him. That's a trade war, tariff to technology war. That's a very negative impact. How we restore that's a basic communication now is really important. Just the, now, Ambassador Roy mentioned the Biden administration team is professional. I agree with that. I deal with many officials now in this team. I understood they are indeed professional. But I must point out some key issue Biden administration should correct immediately since that is within U.S. interest, including tariff. And uh, just as uh, Secretary Yellen said, that's not U.S. interest. That's the damage, the benefit of U.S. consumers. But uh, until now, six months passed and uh, no any single change. And very key issue beyond tariff, economic side, I think the political side, the Ambassador Roy mentioned the genocide issue. That's absolutely wrong, the judgment made by last administration within the last two weeks in position. And uh, they use this as a reason block import of cotton and uh, tomato produced in Xinjiang. Unfortunately, Secretary of Biden Administration, Secretary of State, that still conform that previous policy and uh, continually to blame the Xinjiang in general side to Xinjiang to Uyghurs. That's absolutely wrong, and that's absolutely that's dangerous for. China-US relation. 
and uh, if let's talk about just as uh, ambassador uh, ambassador roy said that his word is unprecedented risk i think this one is less real cause to result in the conflict because we never think we take action to against the terrorists and against international terrorists to to be the genocide so this one we must be use public and uh, private conversation communication to solve and uh, that's why china will come the the foreigners to visit xinjiang and i know that the foreigners they say they want very freely uh visit so that's that's a debate. We should have real professional way to solve this problem. I think that these obstacles we must overcome. We must find real fact to solve this problem. This very key for Chinese principles. I just one case. And I do think such as communication, both sides see very clearly to the point on the table is very useful. As uh, Adam suggests, uh, he suggested three, that's the point. I think that's, uh, uh, that's very, very important. One Adam said that something beyond the economic situation. Yes, we should have the more comprehensive discussion. And uh, for this one, we should find a way how to expand our discussion beyond economic. Also, I think that everything will connect with economic relations because our entrepreneurs need this good environment for their investment in China or Chinese enterprise investment in US. We, we should find the way. And the uh, second climate change certainly become less real the way for cooperation, including ESG. That's, I think this already beyond the pure climate change issue and that's more broad, more comprehensive. And uh, think tank certainly is that's a real channel for our cooperation. In this regard, I think as maybe very quickly a four point suggestion. One is we, China, US must find the way to deal with each other's challenge and uh, to develop peaceful coexist and uh, based on communication, based on understanding each other and uh, enhance our cooperation to the peaceful coexist. Second, we must keep open and uh, reform both China and the US. China is more depending structure reform, more open to the outside world. That's our domestic interest force. And also in line with global cooperation. This one, we have many, many ways, many, many things can be discussed. Third point is uh, we must have real cooperation a multilateral system trade, financial, WHO, WHO, IMF, World Bank, and uh, other UN special agencies. And this global network that uh, need our cooperation to maintain it, to improve it, to enhance it, and make this, uh, the world is in peace and uh, development. The last one certainly I suggest we keep this real dialogue, communication, and we need real mechanisms such as SED, such as the BIT in Obama administration, we negotiate. I join that deeply. I know near 90% of BIT we need, we finished. This last very important issue we not solved is digital 
economy issue related that's the data flow cross board data privacy issue that's today become more important and uh, now every country including us china eu and others to emphasize domestically how important to develop of digital economy to enhance the security of cyber system and enhance the, the privacy. And those all need this global coordination, global negotiation. Maybe one brick point possible is e-commerce negotiation in WTO. I know that's still very difficult. We should try. And uh, that's for the future growth. And uh, that's a real need for our cooperation between China, US. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister Zhu. I think you have raised many uh, uh, good points as well. And uh, uh, one of the particular points I, I really uh, uh, strongly agree with you. I, th I think there's quite a bit of uh, uh, probably uh, misunderstanding on, on issues in Xinjiang. And of course, China uh, uh, has in the past, has no experience dealing with terrorism. There could be uh, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, the way the handle you know needs to be improved but but definitely it's far from genocide i think you know that uh, uh pompeo has actually think about that term and then while blinken get uh, testified that the at the senator he 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 wanted to get passed and he probably get go, went along with what pompeo suggested but then they don't have to own it i think that the xinjiang is really open i mean all the foreigners can go there i i recently we, we talked to some uh, China, uh, China, uh, uh, foreign embassy officials actually uh, in the conference, they acted, you know, the ambassador didn't go, but the embassy staff did send people there. They all come back with their own report. I mean, it's obvious. There's, there's nothing uh, like said as, as a genocide happened. So any foreigners, you go to Xinjiang, there's no special, there's no restriction, just buy your ticket and you can go. So, uh, and see whatever you like to see. So, so I think that, that issue has to be sorted out so that we can reduce the tension uh, and also seeking more uh, uh, collaboration, as the Minister Drew mentioned about you know, this BIT, if it's 90% concluded, why can't we continue this 10%? Because data uh, and issues like that, after several years, six years now, uh, from the uh, Obama administration, we have a lot of uh, uh, new progress. Now China is, uh, is a big data uh, uh, country, and he realized data is oil. If you don't flow, there's no wealth in being created. So many, many channels like uh, China recently agreed to join this uh, OECD G7 proposal of a minimum uh, global corporate tax, which is a good example how we can avoid these uh, loopholes and uh, uh, that uh, uh, that really, uh, you know, the money can really benefit uh, both the host and, and home country. And, and also we can talk on uh, WTO, as Minister Drew said, and also uh, CPTPP, as uh, uh, Biden Obama administration, which concluded. Uh, China announced they're going to join in, and Minister Commerce has put TPP agreement on the Minister of uh, Commerce website. So that's the standard, that's the target, that's that's where we should aim for. So I mean, China is not not uh, afraid of uh, talking to those points, but I, I I hope that we have more channels to talk, including WTO, so that we can do that. Uh, but now I really would like to invite our very senior uh, uh, our panelist, <laughs> also very very. Uh, 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 highly influential. I mean, uh, uh, John, you you are uh, the honorary chair for for Brookings for a long time. I know that uh, uh, Brookings even set up a China Center called your name, <laughs> John Center China Center. And of course, you are uh, 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 you know, that has already been over ten years uh, during my days at Brookings. You you already uh, and that, that is already called John Center Center and uh, China Center. But also now you you are the co-chair of Asia Society. Asia Society is very. Uh, influential uh, uh, bridges between China and the U.S. And uh, so, 